Daniel 11.35, <clears throat> and he says, uh, And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them, and to purge, and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. Which one will flip that switch? Um, so he's talking about these... Uh, these people at the end of the tribulation here, we looked at them before, they're the virgins. They're called the virgins in Matthew 25. There's five that are foolish and five that are wise. So that tells you in the tribulation there will be some that are wise and some that are not wise. You know the difference. The basic difference between the wise one and the foolish one is the wise ones make it through. The foolish ones don't. Those are the ones who lose their salvation. I'm saying it that way because that's the way people understand it. There's no salvation in the tribulation. There is an inheritance. They inherit the kingdom or not. Um, so uh, that's found in Matthew 25. But look at it in Revelation 11. Revelation 11. Revelation 11, 1. And if I can figure out on the right, wait, I got to find my instructions here. Hold down the right mouse button and the shift. That didn't work. Huh. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. All right, well, we know how to read, so. <laughs> Revelation 11, verse 1. He said, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, uh, stood uh, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. That is, this whole tribulation is the punishment of God on his nation Israel, and the punisher is the Gentiles. Now, the sneaky thing about it is he uses a half Jew to start it with. To, to have, the Antichrist is partial Jew. Uh, look at verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses. Okay, so that those are um, Moses and Elijah. And they're not part of the body of Christ. They'd be uh, considered virgins, uh, the friends of the bridegroom, verse 3. And they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks that stand before the God of the earth. <clears throat> Look at it in Revelation 7, 4. Revelation 7, 4. Now, of course, those two are sealed. And here's another group of them that are sealed. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of the tribe of the children of Israel. <clears throat> so there's 144,000 sealed. Just like in the Old Testament, some were sealed and some were not. I didn't give you the references. I should have thought to put them in here. The, think of it. Who in the Old Testament was sealed? David, obviously. Um, Moses. Um, I don't Samuel, yeah. Um, I don't, I, I don't have, you'd have to have a verse that said they were. The reason I say Moses is, and he says over there in the Old Testament, he put his Holy Spirit in him. Not on him, in him. That's like what we have, uh, which is different than everybody else. Everybody else, the Holy Spirit came on them, not in them. Um, so that'll be what happens in the tribulation is the Holy Spirit will come on them <clears throat> and can leave. Just like in Matthew 25, the virgins show up and some of them realize they have lost their oil. He left. Um, Daniel 11.35 there, um, he says, um, they'll fall to try them and to purge them and to make white to the time of the end. Okay, so some are going to fall. 
that is, and he's described what the fall is, going into slavery, going into being persecuted heavily. And the reason for that is to make them white. We don't have to go through things in order to make ourselves white. We're washed in the blood of the lamb, and that makes us white. At the end of the uh, our experience in heaven before we come back, he grants us a garment that's pure white. Okay, we didn't do anything for that. When you do something, you earn rewards for it, not a garment. Revelation 6. Revelation 6, verse 11. Now, here's one way they earn it in the tribulation. Get your head cut off. <laughs> but that's a one-time earning. <laughs> You can't earn that. You can't improve on that earning. <laughs> Revelation 6, verse 11, he says, And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and the brethren that uh, should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So there's the souls under the altar who have been uh, beheaded. Revelation 3, verse 5. Revelation 3, 5. This is uh, a good cross-reference to those who have um, fallen in our passage there. That there uh, many will fall in order to try them. They'll fall into um, slavery and into uh, persecution of the Antichrist. He says, Revelation 3, 5. <clears throat> he that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father, and before his angels. <clears throat> that is to say, if they've overcome, they've overcome the devil and the world and all the things that are coming after them, and it'll be much, much tougher for them in their age than what we have it. And he says they've overcome, and because of that, they get the robe that's, uh, that, that we've been granted. Look at it in uh, Revelation 7, verse 9. Revelation 7, 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindred and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Those are people already dead and in, in heaven, or uh, probably Old Testament saints here, and they're clothed in white. Look at it in verse 14. And so the question is, who are they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation. Okay, so great tribulation. Let's think about it. We just saw them that were under the altar, and they uh, were told, sit and wait. Now, he says they've come out of great tribulation. So obviously there was a rapture that raptured them out. Now they're in heaven. Came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The tribulation saints are considered virgins, just like uh, virgins, plural, just like the church. If you're saved now, you're considered the virgin, singular, of Christ, um, or, or the virgin bride of Christ. <clears throat> and the tribulation virgins, just like we found in Matthew 25, are waiting for something. They're waiting to go into the wedding. They're the congregation. <laughs> They're the, um, the what are the, the bridesmaids and the, the all those groomsmaids or whatever. <laughs> the wedding is all about the woman. It's not about the, not about the man. Uh, they're waiting to go into this wedding. And if they don't watch, they don't get to go in. Matthew 25, verse 13. Matthew 25, 13, we're getting into some of the stipulations for maintaining the oil, holding the Holy Spirit in the tribulation. Matthew 25, 13, he says, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Mm. That's in the tribulation. That's an unknown time period. Obviously, that has to be in the middle of the tribulation or somewhere in about there. 
it can't be at the end. Because at the end, they're told the number of days to count until it happens. And so there, that's a little different. The other thing is uh, Matthew 25, look at verse 8. Matthew 25, 8. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil, for our lamps are gone out. That's an unheard of thing. I can't give somebody else my Holy Spirit. <laughs> now they can ask the Holy Spirit to come into them. But here, they're begging someone else to loan them some Holy Spirit. That is, help me get pure and clean. And it works in the tribulation. It does not work in our age. Look at it in Matthew 24, 13. Matthew 24, 13. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Okay, so that's the standard, you can lose your salvation verse, <laughs> and it is fact in the tribulation. If they don't endure to the end of it, then they're going to be subject to the, the wrath of the Antichrist and the Son of God when he comes back. Matthew 25, look at verse 10. Watch what happens to the foolish ones. And while they went to buy, so they've decided, okay, I better straighten up and do right. They went to buy. The bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. Those are those are who were watching for him. And the door was shut. Okay. Afterward came also other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. So they got their oil from the store. Or they started doing the works that were... Uh, meet for repentance and it was too late he'd already come and gone and so now they're saying uh, come back and get us and he will but it won't be immediate verse 12 and he answered and said watch what he says to these virgins verily i say unto you i know you not hmm. that's what he says to someone he cast into hell hmm. that's um the tribulation is not a place you want to be for um, assurance that you'll get into the kingdom because it's going to be shaky. They started, they started out here, all of them, the good ones, the foolish ones, and the wise ones with oil. So it was not like, um, not like these were lost heathens. They all were on the same page to begin with. And then some of them lost it. Hmm. I, I, if you were to put that burden down on the church today, I would say that a lot of people got saved and 90% of them lost it. <laughs> but that didn't apply in our dispensation. We get in Psalm 51. Psalm 51, verse 11. Psalm 51, 11. Here's David after his uh, sin with Bathsheba. This is what he's worried about. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Now, he knew he had it. That's a good thing. And he's saying, I don't want to lose it. And he knew there was a possibility he could lose it. That'll be in the tribulation. They can lose it. Now, he didn't know that he was going to get to keep it. He was worried about it. However, he got what's called the sure mercies of David. That is, that God was merciful and let him keep it. Uh, look at it, Matthew 25, verse 12. 25, 12. This is an odd thing for God to say. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Well, didn't he know everything? <laughs> I'm sure he knows of them, but he means as far as being part of the group, uh, you don't qualify. Find a passage there, another passage, I didn't give it to you, where uh, the fellow's caught at the wedding and he doesn't have a garment on. That is, he shouldn't belong there. That's uh, the, the same category as I know you're not. All right, Daniel uh, 11, verse 36.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to get into that capital in a little while. Daniel 11, verse 36. Capitals are interesting in the Bible. Capital letters. They're not in Greek and they're not in Hebrew. <clears throat> That's something that was um, uh, Holy Spirit driven. And sometimes they mean one thing or the other. And um, sometimes they cause problems. <laughs> Daniel 11, verse 36. And the king shall do according to his will. And he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. And shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods. And shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. So this king obviously is the Antichrist. Nobody misses it on this one. This one is clear. That has to be the Antichrist. Previous to this, they've talked about the kings of the north come against the kings of the south and the east and the west and who knows all those other kings. But this one's clear. They know who this one is. He's uh, the king that has swallowed up all other kings and kingdoms and dominion, and now he is the world ruler. Perfect imitation of Jesus Christ. He's going to come back and inherit all kingdoms. They're all going to be his. Uh, look at it in Revelation 17. Revelation 17, verse 12. Revelation 17, 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have, seen no, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. So, there's these individuals who are given authority and rule and power as though they were kings. And the world views them as their leader or whatever. And they had a one-hour meeting, a devil-casting-in meeting. And out of that meeting, they come out and they get their goodies or they get to rule people. But it's short-lived. The Antichrist is not nice to anybody. His goal is not to help anyone improve. Verse 17. Verse 17. Revelation 17, 17. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will. Huh. This is a strange spot where God overpowers a man's will. This is not a normal thing. And to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God should be fulfilled. Mm. So these kings, they're enjoying their power after they had the one hour meeting. And then the devil says, oh, as soon as you felt comfortable, now it's time to hand it back. It's all mine. And that's his goal is to exalt himself above everything. The second anybody thinks they're getting something good. He comes in to swoop in and steal it. He does according to his will. He exalts himself and magnifies himself above, an interesting phrase, every God. Lowercase g, we understand it. Lowercase g is a phony God, a little God, a demonic God. Get in Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14, 13. This is the devil's message from the beginning of uh, before the before time, <laughs> beginning of the first time, till he goes down. Isaiah 14, 13. For thou said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. A whole bunch of I in there. And uh, he's going to make him fall. Look at it in 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2. You've never found any. You've, on this earth, you find some people that are very cocky and pompous. And it's very off-putting when somebody is um, so proud that all they can do is talk about themselves and put a, everybody around them down. That's just a picture of the devil. That's what he is. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4. Here he is. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. 
or that is worship so that he as what's that word god capital g god sitteth in the temple of god showing himself that he is capital god those capital letters are going to be interesting we'll get to them in a minute <laughs> The free will of man is the determining factor for his eternal destiny. We know that to be so. And many times also in the temporal. A man's will, what his de desires and ambitions are, will determine where he goes. If a man wills to be his own God, he goes where his God goes. Hell. Look at it in Lamentations 3. Talked about this this morning. Lamentations 3, verse 36, my new favorite verse. <laughs> Lamentations 3, 36. He says, To subvert a man in his cause, the Lord approveth not. That is, God's not going to overpower a man's will. He allows a man free will to do what he wants. That makes God powerful. I wouldn't be able to restrain myself enough to allow somebody to make all the stupid decisions that people make on a day-to-day -day basis. But God does. Look at it in Revelation 22. Revelation 22, verse 17. This is the same message that the Holy Spirit and all Christians have been preaching from the instant they got saved or should have been. Revelation 22, 17. And the Spirit and the Bride, that's you, say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is athirst come, and whosoever will, it's a person's will, let him take of the water of life freely. It's a man's own decision God doesn't overpower him. There is no Calvinism. A man gets to decide this for himself. That is a heavy-duty responsibility that God handed over to a man to decide his eternal destiny. Um, and it's almost weighted against him because this flesh is a heavy weight pull in the wrong direction. John 5, John 5, verse 40. John 5, verse 40. When Jesus was walking the earth, here was the problem with those who wouldn't accept him. John 5, 40. And you will not come to me. It's the will. Will not come to me. That you may have life. He says, I want to give you life. You won't come over here and get it. It's not that you don't know how. It's not that it's too complicated. It's the will, the desire. In Genesis 24, Genesis 24, 58. Genesis 24, 58. This is Rebecca. Talk about a tough decision. Rebecca ran into a rich man out there and he was willing to water her camels for her and um, let, the, let the animals, or no, she was willing to water his camels. And um, she, she gets a look at all his jewelry store that he brought with him. <laughs> and and he's offering her to uh, have a uh, mail-order husband. <laughs> I don't think I'd have bought into that one. <laughs> but she does. Uh, now, as a Christian, that's exactly what we've done. You've not seen him. You've seen some of the goodies he's got. You've looked around at the world he created. And you've seen the promises he's made. And you said, I'll buy in. But that was a choice, a will. Here's the same thing. Genesis 24, verse 58. And they called Rebekah and said unto her, Wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I will. It's the will. It's free will. You can't read the Bible and not find free will. Um, you have willed to not see it. <laughs> if you can't find it. Acts 7. Acts 7, verse 51. A Calvinist will say that there's irresistible grace, meaning if you're part of the elect, 
You there is no way for you to refuse it. <laughs> That's crazy too. Acts 7, verse 51, Steve, uh, Stephen's preaching. Ye stiff neck and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Mm. So that was their will was to blame. Now in our verse in uh, Daniel eleven thirty six, 36, it says, And shall speak, uh, there goes our mic, <laughs> And shall speak marvelous things against, here look at these capitals, Against the capital God of lowercase gods. Okay, so there's God's lowercase. We understand that. And they're real. It's not fake and phony. It's not just in somebody's imagination and mind. They are real. Uh, look at it. There's a bunch of verses in the Bible on it. Um, look at um, Genesis 3. Genesis 3, verse 5. Genesis 3, 5, he says, This is the devil talking to Eve. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as lowercase gods, knowing good and evil. All the way back in the garden, she knew there were lowercase gods. She doesn't question the devil on this. She doesn't say, what gods are you talking about? She knew there were demonic forces at play back then, obviously, because they were offering sin. Psalm, Psalm chapter 95. Psalm 95, verse 3. Psalm 95, 3. For the Lord is a great God. And a great king above all gods. Mm. There's nothing uh, make-believe about the satanic world and uh, those that worship the devil and um, Wiccan and all that other stuff. It's real. It is real. It's just they lined up with the loser. My God is over their gods. Amen. Look at it, and um, furthermore, he's going to judge them. Psalm 97. Psalm 97, verse 7. If ever you saw a passage that applied 100% to the tribulation, it's right here. Confounded be all they that serve graven images, that boast themselves of idols, worship him, all ye gods, lowercase. The demonic world, even in the tribulation, um, is going to be influencing for wicked, but they're going to be preached to. Jesus went down to the lower parts of the earth and preached and came up and brought up those uh, souls. But I don't think he just preached to the ones that were held captive. You can't just defeat the devil in a massive public display and not say a word when you go down there <laughs> i think he had something to say to him good luck next time buddy <laughs> i'll see you on the other side <laughs> look at it, psalm 135 psalm 135 verse 5 psalm 135 verse 5 for I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Over and over you find this in Psalms. He speaks of the other gods, lowercase, and they're always on a lower level than our God. Uh, an important one, Psalm 82, Psalm 82, verse 1. Psalm 82, 1, he says, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. The mighty is not Arnold Schwarzenegger or whoever can lift a lot of weight. It's uh, supernatural beings. He judgeth among the gods. That is, my God is in charge of all things that move. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 8. 
1 Corinthians 8, verse 5. Paul recognizes the same thing. He says, For though there uh, be that are called gods, lowercase, whether in heaven or in earth. So, that tells you a location. There are supernatural beings that are considered gods, ruling in dominions. And they're in heavens, and there's some on the earth. Mm, that's scary. <clears throat> then he puts a little more info in the parentheses. As there be gods many, and lords many. That is, there's divisions of gods. But to us, there's but one. Um, now he said in our verse back in, uh, where are we? Daniel eleven thirty six, And shall prosper... Till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Okay, so God's determined. A wild thing. He determined that the devil's going to rule and reign on this earth. And wreak havoc for seven years. And that he's going to prosper. Mm. Now, we think God's going to make Christians prosper, and there's the prosperity gospel. And Well, obviously, the devil believes in the prosperity gospel, too. He's getting it. In the tribulation, God's going to see to it he prospers. 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2.11. 2 Thessalonians 2.11. He says, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Who did that? God sent it. What's the lie? <clears throat> the lie of the Antichrist. God's helping him prosper. Wow. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Whew. There's a lot to that prospering. Uh, we saw in Revelation 17, 17. That God uh, has a will that he determines the Antichrist is going to get all the kingdoms of the world. And he puts it in the hearts of the heathen to hand over their kingdoms to the Antichrist. Whew. I guess he does prosper. Uh, he prospers and it's a God-given prosperity. Uh, I don't know if we've got time. What time has it gotten to? Um, 18. Um, well... We'll start this next one. Daniel 11.37. I don't even know why I asked. <laughs> Daniel 11.37. This is a short one. <clears throat> Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. We haven't made it to the capital G God I wanted to talk about. It's, it's going to be the next week. But we'll get there. So far, it's been identified. Capital G, God is a good one. And lowercase g, God is a bad one so far. It's going to change in a minute. And I'll point it out next week. But in this verse, notice what he doesn't desire is he says the desire of women. Now, there's different ideas of what that means. Okay, let's find out what they are. Here's what's been said about this passage. The desire of a Jewish woman was to give birth to the Messiah. And historically, you could go through and say that sounds good, but it doesn't sound very firm very long. <laughs> Since we're talking about the Antichrist, he's not going to desire to give birth to the, to the Messiah. <laughs> he knows he was already born. The devil's not ignorant of that. So that can't be the explanation for it. The no next thing that it could be <clears throat> is the desire for a husband to rule over her, to run the household, maybe. Genesis 3.15, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Um, that's not the verse I wanted. Um, and that desire shall be unto thy husband or something there. Okay, that's... um. Has that ever really worked? Do women really desire to be bossed around? Okay. 
<laughs> okay, I don't think that's the answer either. <laughs> now, I think the answer is just as simple as it looks. He's going to be a pervert. A man's natural desire is for a woman, and a woman's is for a man. Not same sex, that's not natural. Look at it in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 5. Deuteronomy 5, verse 21. Neither shalt thou desire thy neighbor's wife, neither shalt thou covet thy neighbor's house, his field, his manservant, his maidservant, his ox or his ass, or anything that thy that is thy neighbor's. Okay, so one of the things that our world has sped to as fast as it can get is a satanic sexuality. That is, regardless of what God has engineered the human body to want, they say, no, we'll re-engineer it. As simple as, what birth were you assigned? You weren't assigned something. Well, God assigned it when, he, when you were born. <laughs> You don't get to uh, identify yourself any way you want. Obviously, the Antichrist is going to come in supporting that 100%. Uh, look at it in um, Deuteronomy 21.11. Our verse says that he didn't have the desire of women. I think the di desire there is not a, he doesn't have a female desire. That's not what it's saying. It's saying he does not desire a woman. Look at the way this is worded. Deuteronomy 21, 11. And seest among the captives a beautiful woman and hast a desire unto her that thou wouldest have her to thy wife so forth, so on. This is what it's saying. It's saying the Antichrist does not have that desire. He doesn't desire female companionship. Song of Solomon, Song of Solomon 7, verse 10. Song of Solomon 7, 10. You can figure out what the word means pretty carefully or pretty easily by just looking at the word desire. Song of Solomon 7, 10. My... I am my beloved's, and his desire is toward me. Okay, that's clear. Get it in Ezekiel 24. Ezekiel 24, verse 16. Ezekiel 24, verse 16. Son of man, behold, I take away, uh, I take, I take away from thee, the desire of thine eyes with a stroke, that is, your wife's going to die. Yet neither shalt thou mourn uh, nor weep, neither shalt thy tears run down. Forbear to cry, make no mourning for the dead, so forth, so on. She's called his desire of his eyes. That's his wife. Saying the devil didn't have that. We can see it in our world the time that I've lived on this earth, it has sped so fast towards satanic sexuality that in another 10 years, I don't know that we could go another 10 years, but how much bad can it get? <laughs> That's what we're thinking. Well, it's ripe for the Antichrist to show up because we're already set for it. He's going to forbid marriage in the tribulation. <clears throat> He's going to forbid marriage and meat. Those are two odd things. But he says, I don't want marriage. Well, they're already doing it. The young people, not that it's forbidden, but the young people don't have the desire for it. To me, it makes no sense. Why would you go um, live with someone rather than marrying them and have a contract. I mean, let's face it, it's a contract. If they leave, you get reparations. <laughs> Why would you sign up for, uh, no, I don't want anything, you can leave scot-free anytime you want. And, yeah, all right. It's, it's satanic is what it is. Now, he says, regard any God, 
except it's not just any God. There is one God he does have a regard for, and that'll be in the next verse, and we'll cover that one next week. <laughs> and that's where we have the capital issue. There's a capital and a lower and all that stuff, and y'all can review it, see what you come up with. But uh, that'll be next week. Okay, we better stop it there.